QuickBooks Online 2022 Account and Settings Expenses, Payments, Time, and Advanced Tabs Get ready because it's go time with QuickBooks Online 2022 here we are in our Get Great Guitars practice file. We set up with a 30-day free trial here in the Get Things Done page, which used to be the home page. Holding control down, scrolling up just a bit to get to that 125%. We're looking at the preferences, which are in the cog up top generally, noting that when you're doing normal day-to-day -day types of transactions, you're typically going to the plus button and or you're going to the centers on the left-hand side. Also noting that the centers or activity or items on the left-hand side could be in the business view currently, or you could have the accounting view, which you could switch to by going to the cog up top and switching to the accounting view. We're gonna keep them at the business view at this time and go into the account and settings. Account and settings on the left-hand side. We've been going through them on the left company, bill and subscription usage, sales, and now we're gonna be down in the expenses area. So we have the bills and expenses. I'm gonna click into it so we can drill down on it. Show items table on expenses and purchase forms. So the items table is gonna be on by the default. It adds a product service tab on expense and purchase forms so you can itemize products and services. So when you're purchasing items, you're often thinking about inventory items. So these would be things that if you're dealing with inventory purchasing and selling uh, the inventory, then you'd want the items tab typically there so it could track the inventory units that are being purchased on the purchasing side of things with say an expense form, a bill form, and the purchase order. So show tags, uh, show tags field on the expenses and purchase forms. So the tags are that kind of specialty type of area that can give you an added level of tracking that could be useful in special kind of areas. We're not gonna be talking about tags in the practice problem, but we might take a look at them after the practice problem in a bit more detail because they are an interesting tool. Track expenses and items by customer adds a customer feel as a customer column on expense and purchase forms uh, so you can track expense and items by customer. So in other words, when you enter like an expense form or a check, the things that decrease the checking account or a bill, like an expense type of form, then you might want the customer on it. Why would you want the customer on it? Because usually you would want the vendor on it, the person you're paying, because you might want to add the customer to see who you're paying it for and possibly use it for a billable item, which is the next item make expense and items billable as a billable column to an expense and purchase form so you can add so you can add billable expenses and items on the sales forms so in other words when you make an expense type of form you might say that it's going to be a billable item so it will then pull that item over into the invoice when you create an invoice for that particular customer so in other words you create for example an expense form and you pay for the a gas bill or something like that, the auto bill, you add the customer into the customer field, even though you're paying on the vendor side of things, money's going out. And then on the customer side, you add the customer field and you say it's billable, which means that when you then go into invoicing that customer, you could pull that information in. Now you gotta be careful about that because you gotta be careful about if you're not using the items properly, it might not record the invoice as revenue, but as a negative, uh, expense like a reimbursement which isn't exactly what you usually want to see so you want to look at the items we'll look at that more in future presentations i'm going to keep it off for now and then we'll probably uh, turn it on some point in the practice problem and we'll note uh, turning it on when we do so default uh, bill pay terms so the bill pay terms let's default it to net uh, 30 net 30 so that's going to be similar as to the receivable side so when we enter the bill we're going to assume it's due in 30 days now the bills are a lot more tricky because uh, when you have a, a receivable you can set the standard date but when you get the bill from a vendor you you might not get it at the exact same date and so 30 days might not be the, the standard that's why they don't really have a default standard you might have to set the term date or the end date so that you could properly track when it's going to be due but i'm going to keep it at the net 30 here. We're gonna save it and close it. Uh, purchase orders, so these are gonna be the types of things that we're requesting inventory. They don't actually have a financial transactions to them and they would only be in there if you're dealing with inventory and you're in a situation where you can actually request the inventory without actually paying for it and then get the bill once we receive the inventory. So the purchase orders, we've got them on here. So we're gonna be using the purchase orders on by default and then 
custom fields, go to settings, list custom fields to manage your custom field. So we might have some custom items that we can add into the custom fields on the purchase orders. We're going to keep the default settings at the standard purchase order. Custom, custom transaction number lets you use your own number system. Uh, if left blank, purchase order numbers are automatically assigned by QuickBooks. I'm going to keep them assigned by QuickBooks. We can also have a default message on the purchase order if we so choose. The message is down below. Default email sent with the purchase order. So if we have the purchase order, if we're tracking inventory or purchasing and selling inventory, and we send out the purchase order, this is another document that would be going to someone external this time to people we're buying from instead of people that we're selling to. And we have the greeting that you could send with the email, which would be the dear and then you've got the name format that you can go formal less formal and so on purchase order from get great guitars is the subject line please find your purchase order attached to this email thank you get great guitars short and sweet you can change it if you want though and then you can have a copy of the email going to you although that would probably if you have a lot of purchase orders be a lot of emails so typically most people might turn that off but it might be useful and that is that so let's go on to the payments area uh, quickbooks online get paid more ways fast they like saying that get paid get paid more ways fast take credit cards and bank trans transact uh, transfer so these are other kind of payment options and you can look into whether or not these options would be right for you and they might be add-on types of features that you could uh, look into we're not going to turn them on for the practice problem we might look into them again a little bit more after the practice problem but you can research them on the learn more here accept payments through quickbooks email invoices and mobile uh, quickbooks automatically updates when you're paid and then you've got the existing account if you already have a payments account with intuit you may know uh, it as the go payment or merchant services so then let's go to the time area general first day of the week so we're going to say the first day of the week is sunday for a seven day week you, as opposed to possibly monday the time sheets that you have show service fields which is when entering time sheets lets you spe uh, specify services performed so this is if you're using time sheets which you could use in order to help you track time for your uh, employees and you can also use them to track time for billable time which you can then use to create invoices with we'll take a look at these in a little bit more or timesheets when we do our practice problem allow time to be billable so that's going to be on timesheet as a checkbox to specify whether activities should be billed uh, to the customer that's on by default that's a typical thing we're going to use it for and we'll test that out in our practice problem a little bit show billing rate on the users uh, entering time so if you bill customers a different hourly rate then uh, then you pay your employees and subcontractors you may want to leave this blank so in other words you pay you pay your employees you might pay them hourly but you might bill them out at a different rate most likely a higher rate than the what you pay them hourly or possibly you know it's, it could be different so when you're using the the time sheets to calculate the hours you might have a different hourly rate for the for the employee section versus when you're billing with an invoice Okay, let's go to the advanced tab. We have the accounting up top, uh, first month of the fiscal year. So it's, we're looking first month, not last month. I used to look at these and always think, well, it's a December year end thing. And then, you know, you want to put December in there, but they're asking for the first month, which if it's a calendar year would be January, first month of the tax year, which could be different, right? The fiscal year, tax year, you could have a difference. So we're going to keep it the same here, however, uh, as the as the fiscal year the accounting method accrual i would keep that as the default unless your accountant specifically says otherwise you might say hey i'm on a cash basis method because i get paid at the same point in time that i do the work and i'm recording my stuff on a cash basis i don't have accounts receivable and accounts payable but you'll be able to track that generally by the fact that you're not using the accrual forms in other words instead of using an invoice form You'll be using a sales receipt form, which is the cash basis form, or you'll just be recording the, the income when you make the deposit. And you will not be using a bill form if you're on a cash basis, but just a check or expense form when you're making payments. That's how you'll be on a cash or accrual basis. So this will kind of change when QuickBooks possibly could recognize some income. And again, you don't really want to do that unless you have a specific reason to do that. So I'd be very careful of changing that to a cash basis method. You could still use a cash basis method 
by basically just entering data into the system in the format of a cache basis method. But if you have to do an accrual thing, it's usually good to be to have the capacity to do that. So word of advice there, talk to your accountant if you want to go to a cache basis. Close the books. Uh, here we've got the close the, close the books. It says uh, when you're ready to close out the year, close your books to prevent unwanted changes before filing your taxes. This locks your books so no one can edit your accounting data before closing, uh, before closing date. So in other words, uh, you, QuickBooks will automatically kind of close out the retained earnings, the temporary accounts into the equity account. The problem is that it's so flexible in adjusting prior transactions and prior periods that, that people often go in and mess up the prior period transactions for something that had already been finalized and if that's the case, then your retained earnings will not roll over from year to year. So you can kind of close out the books here by toggling that on. And then, and then it says allow changes after viewing a warning. And you could set the closing date. So that's really a good thing to do, especially if you have multiple people working in a file. Because you're basically saying don't mess up the prior year or don't mess it up. You know, don't do anything before this period or you're going to mess it up. So you have unsaved changes. Do you want? I'm not going to save any changes. Let's go to the next one. Company type. They've asked us this a couple times, and again, I don't think it has a lot of difference on what's actually going to be uh, in the tax in the actual software. But you know, the company the types would be because they're not changing like the retained earnings section or anything like that. But in any case, you want to choose the proper type of format of your company. Are you a sole proprietor, which typically means you report your, your taxable income in the United States on the Schedule C. One person, for example, partnership means you'll typically be reporting on a Form 1065 for your taxes. And then that will flow through to your individual partner 1040s. If you have two or more people in like a partnership kind of situation, then you've got the uh, 1120S, which is an S corporation, which is another flow through type of entity, but it's set up as a corporation attempting to get the best of both worlds of a corporation liability protection and the flow through of the S corp. You might also have some tax benefit things with regards to payroll and whatnot. But in any case, we've got the corporation standard C corp. This isn't a flow through entity, separate legal entity form 1120 nonprofit, of course, form 990 limited liability company, which is kind of like a partnership in general, although you can make a single member LLC type of company. And uh, it's a flow through type of entity as well. And not sure here, which I, if you said not sure, I don't think it'll change anything, but you could probably pick the one that's applicable. We're going to keep the sole proprietorship chart of accounts enable account numbers now the default is off for the account numbers which means that remember the chart of accounts is in order by in essence the ordering of the balance sheet on top of the income statement meaning assets liabilities and equity and then income or revenue and expenses and then subcategories within that to get more detailed like bank accounts accounts receivable other current assets and so on if you wanted more detail within a certain section in terms of more control over it such as the expenses for example uh, then you can turn on account numbers because if you don't, it's going to then within the expenses category uh, start to order it by uh, alphabetical order or it'll order it. Also, you have some control with the sub accounts, but alphabetical order in general. So you can turn account numbers on, but you have to be careful with the account numbers if you want them. We're not going to turn them on here. We might talk about them later or after the practice problem, because if you don't do the account numbers correctly and you don't know how to set them up, then it's going to make things worse, right? It's going to make them more ugly. It's, and it also takes a little bit more work. So they keep them off by default. Uh, tips, uh, tips account, the account that goes with the setting sales, sales form content and the tips. So if you have tips that you're dealing with, that might be applicable. We've got the uh, class tracking, the locations tracking. These are great tools. They have, they're like the tags in that they have a lot of different versatility depending on your different specialized needs. I'm not going to turn them on here. We might touch on them a little bit after the major practice problem as a class field on forms so you can assign transactions to different segments like departments locations and products versus we have the location as a location field on forms so you can assign transactions to different locations like stores sales regions and so on so these actually help you like make uh, financial statements especially the income statement broken out by column to give you this different these different areas which is really a neat thing, but we're not turning it on with the practice problem we're working in here. Automation, 
pre-fill forms with previously entered content, so automatically fills other fields of the form based on the last uh, served transaction for the customer. That's really useful because in the second month that we enter data, we'll see that it'll be a lot easier to enter data because we will have uh, automatically entered some of the transactions as we enter the vendors and the customers. And then we've got automatically apply credits, automatically applies credits to next invoice uh, you create for the same customer. Most companies turn this setting uh, turn this setting on. Turn it off if you if you if you're a property manager that requires a security deposit. So if there's a credit, then and there, then the next invoice we make it automatically applies the credit. Now they're saying, and that's usually good. So that means if we got a prepayment, for example, and we want to apply out the credit to an invoice we make later, then it's nice that the system will do that automatically. However. You can imagine situations where that would be a problem, such as a security deposit, which means they are going to have a credit on the books all the time that supposedly you're going to get back at the end of the rental agreement, which you know you never will anyways. They're just going to say that there's something wrong with it and they'll take it. But whatever, they, in theory, they're supposed to give that back. So in any case, automatically invoice unbilled activity, automatically creates invoices uh, for customers with unbilled activities. So it's off. We're going to keep it off by default, meaning if you if you put in time from the timesheets, for example, if it would automatically bill them or you want to manually bill them, it's, it might be better to do it manually because then you can actually kind of review <laughs> the bills that are being created from the time when you put them together. Automatically apply bill payments. When you add, when you add bill payments uh, in the register, this set of setting automatically applies the payments to the oldest existing bills. So it's similar that we saw on the on the receiving side of thing or the credit side of things. We're going to then, if you have a bill, it's going to apply it to the to the oldest bill that's outstanding, which would generally be what you'd want to do. Projects is a specialty area. We're not going to deal with the projects in in depth here. Uh, lets you see all your sales expenses and timesheet uh, by project. So that would be specific to a particular type of industry that you're using the projects tool, a great tool for specific types of things you might be using it for, but we'll not focus on it in this practice problem. Home currency, it's and we're using the United States dollar. The general idea on the currencies would be that, of course, if you're outside of the United States, the idea of the accounting is you're going to account for things in whatever the currency is. So that's whatever currency is your currency. That's what you're going to be using. If you turn on multiple currencies, then you're going to have a home currency. And then if you have transactions that deal with other currencies, it's going to have to denominate the other currencies in basically the home currency, right? We want all the financial statements to be uh, measured with the tool, the measuring tool of the home currency. So we'll have the United States here. If you have some other currency, the accounting basically will work, you know, in essence, the same. It's just that it'll have a different, a different currency. So other uh, other preferences, a uh, date format. So here we're going to keep the default, the month, the day, the year. But you might be in an area where you prefer the date, month, year, the date, month, year like this. You might like the, the year first. This is sometimes useful when you're when you're uh, saving data, because uh, if it's in order by date, you'd like the year first and then the month and then the day rather than the month and the year at the end. So that could be a useful format. But in any case, number format. We're going to keep this number format. So if you have some other number formatting that uh, is preferred, you can do that. And then we got the customer label, uh, the customer label, clients, customers, donors. Now this obviously could be useful if you if you have some other type of business that's not a for like a nonprofit. So you could call them clients if you're a, if you're a you know in a law firm or possibly CPA firm. Customers is the standard like and then donors if you're at a nonprofit guests. If you're in a in a uh, uh, some kind of something with real estate, for example, members, uh, patients, and tenants, so you can call them whatever is the appropriate name for the people that you're charging <laughs> that are hopefully giving you money at some point. So here it replaces the word customer wherever QuickBooks uses it. In essence, they're saying, "Warn me when I enter a bill number that's already used." So that's going to be on. Warn if du duplicate check numbers is used. So that's on. It doesn't have this one on. We'll keep it off by the default. Warn if duplicate journal number is used. We'll keep it off by the default. Sign me out if uh, inactive for. So if you're not using it for an hour, it'll sign you out as a default uh, mechanism. And of course, you can change those settings as well. So those, those are going to be those items.
back to the home page. I mean, the get things done page.